I would like to share with you details of a CNC conversion I did for a South Bend SB1001 lathe. This conversion is interesting because the parts were 3D printed and the controller is an Arduino. It was also small enough that I could get it down into my basement. My dad and I were able to lift the lathe onto the bench without any tools. This is what we're going for. Two motors mounted on the lathe, one controlling the cross feed and one controlling the carriage. No attempt was made to control spindle speed, although it would be pretty straightforward by replacing the speed potentiometer with a DAC. After the conversion, we'll be able to easily make parts like this, parts that have multiple radii and ball ends. This lathe was selected partially because after a conversion, there would be few parts that would be discarded. Depending upon the accuracy we would like to achieve, a great deal of the lathe could be used as is. For higher accuracy, we'll replace the lead screws with ball screws. In the 3D printed conversion, to keep costs under control, I didn't use a ball screw, but I did replace the lead screw with a, a new Acme screw. Replacing the crossfeed lead screw is challenging because of the small amount of clearance that's available. Another reason that I 3D printed the conversion parts is I had spent a lot of time on this model. That may be a drawback of CAD. It's easy to make new versions, so it's easy to never be satisfied, and you just keep iterating. At some point, you just have to say that you're done, and that's the point that I had reached when I 3D printed the parts. I didn't tap access to a mill. Doing this also helped me to explore some of the advantages and limitations of 3D printing for mechanical design. The motors that I use were on loan from a friend. They're manufactured by Oriental Motor, and they're a closed loop stepper motor. They're directly attached to AC mains without a need for a power supply. They have a built-in resolver for feedback, so there's never lost steps. The motors are very undersized with respect to what is normally used for a conversion. Most likely when motors are chosen, they're done so with a large amount of margin. This is a chance to explore the suitability of smaller motors. These motors also have a nice speed torque curve. There isn't a lot of torque loss with high RPM, and that may have to do with the higher operating voltage. Here the Arduino is sending pulses to the motor driver, and we're measuring the maximum RPM with a stroboscope. The speed torque curve suggests that the maximum speed is 4000 RPM. I was never able to achieve that high of a speed that likely has more to do with the Arduino than it does with the motor. The easiest way to use a stroboscope is to start with the highest speed and decrease it until you see only one stationary copy of the shaft flat. As you pass through multiples of the shaft speed, you'll see copies of the flat. Once you reach the true speed of the shaft, you'll see only one copy. However, if you continue to decrease the flash rate, you'll see other speeds at which the shaft appears stationary. These are not true speeds of the shaft, but instead fractions of the actual speed. An Arduino Mega was used to generate step and direction pulses. Custom software was written for the Arduino, which took a function to generate the longitudinal and cross-feed motions. G-code was not used. And while the shapes that can be generated from this program are limited, the emphasis was on development time so the ideas of the conversion could be tested. Here the motors are being exercised by the controller. The motor that is turning the most is the longitudinal axis motor. The motor that's turning the least is the cross feed motor. If you watch carefully, you might recognize retractions and rapid motions. The Orinal motor drives have nice terminal breakouts that make wiring easy. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough to make my wiring job look nice. If you notice, there's an unusual sound to the motors. I'm not sure what caused this noise, I thought maybe it was in the coupler, but I don't know for sure. The Arduino is connected to a laptop, but it's only for programming the Arduino. There's no communication otherwise between the laptop and the Arduino. The Oriental motor drives are a little larger than other drives, but they don't require a separate power supply, so you actually save space. Now we're going to begin the actual conversion, and the first method that we're going to use is replacing the hand wheels. We simply take the hand wheels off and bolt the motors in place. This allows one to switch between CNC and manual operation with minimal effort. The CNC conversion is not permanent. First we'll replace the cross feed hand wheel. The adapter is in two parts. The opaque part is the motor adapter. The same motor adapter will be used for both axes. The transparent part mounts against the cross feed slide. By printing this in two parts, it's easier to maintain the parallel surfaces between the motor and the cross feed slide. Both of these surfaces are flat with the print bed. If we attempted to print this as one object, there'd be overhang to deal with, and maintaining that parallelism becomes harder. The two parts are held together with a couple of screws. For all of the printed parts, one of the original MakerBots was used. I've since replaced the MakerBot with a TAS-5, but I believe the MakerBot produced better quality prints. All the parts are printed in ABS. You may be able to see a little bit of delamination in this part near the top. Likely those layers are where the screw holes are at. Here we're making a coupler to attach the motor to the crossfeed lead screw. We first pry the adapter in place. The original screw holes are used. The coupler from Masumi installed. 
This shows the relationship of the coupler to the motor adapter. Again, this same motor adapter is used on both axes. The slits near the base of the adapter provide access points for Allen wrenches to the coupler. All holes are printed under size and drilled out the final size on drill press. And here the motor has been slid onto the coupler and the screw is being tightened. Now the crossfeed axis is complete. An improvement was made to the crossfeed adapter which retained access to the dial indicators. The MakerBot was able to span this overhang well. With 3D printing, it's easy to produce parts that would be difficult by traditional machining methods. There is a little bit of delamination at the layer of the overhang. A little bit of superglue is added to the crack just to strengthen the part. And finally, the improved crossfeed adapter is installed. The carriage is moved with the hand wheel via a rack and pinion system. This is the design of the adapter that will replace the carriage hand wheel. Again, the motor adapter design is identical to the one used on the crossfeed. The orientation of the print has an effect on its strength. And here the assembly is ready to be mounted onto the apron. In the side of the apron, two holes are drilled and tapped. The carriage adapter is installed. Our motor will use the existing gear reduction in the rack and pinion system of the carriage. And finally, the carriage motor is installed. A lathe operator mainly uses the carriage and crossfeed hand wheels. By replacing these with motors, we now have a machine that can replicate the same motions. However, under computer control, more complicated shapes can be easily made. Coordinated motion between the carriage and crossfeed could eliminate the compound, providing additional swing over the crossfeed slide. This is a test of the basic motions and to verify the motors have sufficient torque. These motors are closed loop and cannot lose steps. When I create resistance and stop the carriage, the motor does not lose those steps. Eventually it catches back up. Ideally, when resistance is encountered on one axis, the second axis would slow down to accommodate. Perhaps also the spindle should slow down. The motor has just barely enough torque in order to move the carriage using the rack and pinion system. There's a split in the rack that takes a little bit extra power to get past. Occasionally, I assist the motor by pushing the carriage past the split in the rack. Here we see the servo behavior in action. Steps that would have otherwise been lost are recaptured. In a normal conversion, the carriage would not be driven using the rack and pinion system. There's too much slop in it. Instead, a ball screw would be used to drive the carriage. Instead of the expense of a ball screw, I'm going to use the existing lead screw. Initially, I tried driving the carriage using the existing lead screw half nut. This had far too much friction and required more torque than what the motors were able to provide. A new, smoother running Acme nut was installed. Also tested was a zero backlash Acme nut. The zero backlash Acme nut was made from Delrin and had a spring that expanded to compensate for wear. Unfortunately, it had more resistance than the half nut and could not be used. Instead, a new Acme nut was installed. This is the power into the lathe. The shaft that's coming through this tensioning arm is the lead screw. Onto the lead screw is mounted a series of gears that are used to synchronize the spindle to the lead screw speed. This is necessary for threading operations. In place of the gears, we'll mount a motor and drive the lead screw with it. This is the design of the motor and lead screw adapter. The handle will mount onto the tensioning arm. There's only that single point of attachment, but attachment is straightforward. Here we see the adapter installed. The coupler slid into place. The motor and motor adapter are installed. A clamp is installed to hold the lead screw in place. This clamp is also made from Delrin. Care must be taken when tightening this type of clamp as they're easy to break. We'll attach the lead screw to the carriage using a new Acme nut and an adapter. The horseshoe boss has increased the strength of the part. It's probably not necessary, but it was easy to add with 3D printing. The threads for the Acme nut are printed. I did not use a tap to true them. And here we see the Acme lead screw nut and its adapter installed on the carriage. We're still driving the crossfeed with the previous system, but we're driving the carriage with a lead screw that has less backlash than the previous rack and pinion system. The backlash of the crossfeed is minimal compared to the rack and pinion of the carriage. With a more sophisticated controller that could accept G-codes such as Linux CNC, this machine could already produce basic parts. While not of high precision, it would still be useful for ornamental turnings. For all of the tests, I used wood. It's less expensive and will be more forgiving if there is a problem. With the first lead screw based system, I had it installed support at the far end. Because the motors have low torque, any reduction in friction is useful. We'll try to stabilize the lead screw by installing a support at the far end.
This new adapter had better rigidity than the previous adapter that was attached with only one screw. This overhang was too large to print without support. The support material comes out easily, although there are a few burrs left. The burrs are quickly cleaned up with a drum sander mounted in a drill press. This is the new lead screw adapter mounted in place of the original bearing support. Because we have shifted the lead screw, we can shorten the support end and make it more rigid. We again make use of the existing holes to mount the support. To this point, the lead screw has been supported by the plastic parts. And while the friction isn't bad, the lead screw is rubbing against and wearing the plastic parts. To further reduce friction and to improve longevity, we'll add thrust and ball bearings to the power and support ends. This is the support end assembly. Another collar clamp is used, which presses against thrust bearings, pushing against the ball bearing into the support assembly. A small amount of support material is used, and here the support end is with the ball bearing inserted. The power end adapter is a bit more complex. Ball bearings are installed on either side of the adapter, pressed and held in place with thrust bearings and collar clamps. To accommodate the bearings, the entire adapter had to be increased in size, and a small cutout was necessary for the screws. The lead screw was turned down slightly to fit the ball bearing on the support end, with the exception of the motor and the Acme lead screw. These are all the parts that were installed for the final CNC carriage. The controller is pretty simple. The motion is pretty slow. I didn't program it with acceleration. The top speed of the motor is limited by what it's able to achieve from a standstill before stalling. It may look like the part is changing rotational speed, but it's just an artifact of the camera and lighting. I don't know if I would recommend this approach for making a CNC lathe to anyone, but it was a fun project. It only took a weekend and it was low cost. And it gave me something tangible to show for all the time that I put into building the model of the lathe. All the files for the lathe model and the CNC conversion are available. The links are in the description. I hope there's at least some ideas here that you've benefited from. If nothing else, this is a pretty interesting CNC conversion using 3D printed parts on a metalworking lathe controlled by an Arduino to turn wood parts. And no 3D printing project would be complete without a few disasters. I have no idea what these parts are supposed to be. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun doing this conversion. If you liked the video, please hit the like button. If you have an interest in CNC conversions, electronics, programming, please subscribe. More videos coming.